we make first impressions in the blink of an eye. Well, in reality, that's not necessarily true. According to a news article from MIT News in 2014 by Ann Trafton, a team of MIT neuroscientists found that the human brain processes entire images sent by the eye in as little as 13 milliseconds. So let's think about that. 13 milliseconds is 20 times faster than a blink of an eye. We perceive the world and the world perceives us in the fraction of a second, subconsciously, conditioned response. That 13 milliseconds is inherent to who we are. But why is this factoid of science important to me? Even though I come here today as Savannah, I live a predominantly biologically male life as Chuck. I've had the same job in the same career for 25 years. I'm once divorced, have two college degrees, and I'm in the middle, the forgotten middle, unfortunately, of three kids living and raised in a conservative Midwest family. If I had come here as Chuck today, your initial impression and response would have been completely different, start from a completely different vantage point than today. As Savannah, with the hair and the heels and the makeup and the clothes, you have to look through a lot more layers to see the exact same person. I identify as dual gender and non-binary. I use the label of male to female crossdresser. I'm an LGBTQ plus advocate. I co-host a podcast. I'm a published author of fiction and nonfiction, and obviously a TEDx speaker. A year ago, I stood on the TEDx red dot and told my story of cross-dressing and how I wanted people to use advocacy and intention and education in order for those like me to have a healthy, positive, authentic life. Well, interestingly enough, weeks go by and I kind of forgot about the TEDx and its release date, but my friend Julie contacted me and said, oh my God, your TEDx is up, it's online, here's a link, go watch it. So I did, I dropped everything, put the link on my phone, sat there, watched it, super critical about what to do with my hands, did I smile enough, did I move enough? But at the end, I was very proud of the message and how it turned out. But as we all know from social media, it's not about how I felt about it. I wanted to see how other people felt about it. In that exact moment, Julie contacted me again to say, hey, whatever you do, don't read the comments. Well, that was kind of a challenge and also too late because I had already read every comment, good and bad, a thumbs up and a thumbs down. There was many positive comments, they were encouraging, they were thankful, they were supportive, but just as many negative comments were in there, stating and claiming that I was mentally ill, that I must have suffered from child abuse, and that was an abomination to God. And as a matter of fact, a week ago today, before appearing, somebody claimed that I am a sick man with no sense of reality. All those seem pretty unfounded to me and don't really equate to who I feel I am. And every one of those were, I perceive as a first response to either the way I appeared or the fact that I labeled myself as a crossdresser. But what is crossdressing? Well, the simple definition is the art and act of wearing clothing not assigned to your biology. Now I use that as an art form to best express myself in my gender duality as Savannah. And other non-binary folks use it as well for presentation, for haircut, clothing, comportment, how they move. Uh, it's, it's just the best, it is the best way they can use to express themselves. And for those who are uninitiated, non-binary defines an individual who identifies as both male and female, or identifies as a blend of both in varying degrees, or they may not identify as either. But back to the point at hand, our first impressions are so tied into the social acceptability of appearance. You know, one thing I, I like to point to people, and it seems a very dated reference, but in 1930s Hollywood, there was a young starlet named Katherine Hepburn. You may remember her from On Golden Pond with Henry Fonda. Um, she was very brash, very bold, very opinionated, and she wore pants. That seems silly now, but women wearing pants in 1930s, women could be detained and arrested lawfully for masquerading as men, just for wearing pants. Now, 
Katherine Hepburn did not stop there. She continued with her own advocacy of self. And she was also caught by Hollywood reporters who also claimed that her wearing pants and her fashion choices were a perversity in women, as well as a sure sign of lesbianism. Again, it seems absurd by today's standards. But with the advent of World War II and the changing workplace and involved more women and more jobs and more industrial fields, pants became a necessity. And then it became acceptable. And now, as we all know, in many, many decades, they're fashionable. I mean, isn't it crazy to think that people can be arrested purely about their appearance? That's so last century. That would never happen in this century. Oh, wait, it could. According to a PBS NewsHour Weekend article in 2015, a person perceived as a man wearing clothing specifically designed for women could technically be arrested for impersonating a female. Again, that seems absurd, but luckily that 19th century statewide New York law was eventually overturned. When? 2011, this millennium. And while most of these laws across the country have been deemed frivolous and have been overturned or abandoned or ignored, men still don't have or enjoy the freedom or social acceptability of wearing feminine attire, whereas women are almost celebrated at this point for the ability to wear more masculine attire. So it all boils down to appearance and what's socially acceptable. That 13 milliseconds was meant to keep you safe. That conditioned response was meant to keep you safe. It's unavoidable, it's ingrained in who we are. None of us are above it, we all have it. And I'm no different. Before I moved from New York to South Carolina, I was overly concerned about how Southerners would see this. Now, what are my preconceptions based on? Well social stereotypes, caricatures of people in the South, moving from a liberal to a conservative state, my concern for marginalization, but most importantly, the unnerving amount of reports in the news and on social media that define that gender diverse people living a public life in conservative regions of the country face the real threat of physical harm. So when I did finally come down here with my girlfriend and moved to the upstate of South Carolina, Savannah stayed hidden for over six months. And it wasn't until my girlfriend Judy found a meetup group for me to go to that I even ventured out again. But the problem is between the safety at home and the safety of the venue, there's plenty of Southerners in between that I had to pass. So as I hurried from the safety of my home to my car and from the safety of the car to the restaurant, I met a few Southerners along the way. Surprisingly, my preconceptions seemed a little off because most people didn't even care that I walked by them. And those people who did meet my gaze gave me a polite nod in a very Southern way and moved about their evening. So I started to realize that the more I went out, the more this preconception seemed to be true. And that made me realize that my preconception of what Southerners were like was just as unfounded as those people with the negative reactions to my TEDx talk. So with that, I started going out more and more. And with that, I've now made Savannah a weekly routine where I go out to coffee shops in the upstate area local to my, my home. And just to be out in the world, work on my laptop, have a coffee, feel the energy, and be a part of society. With that, on one of those adventures, a fellow patron leaned in close to me and said, hey, can I ask you a personal question? And I've, I have uh, run into this before, and I was happy to oblige, so I said, sure. And then she sa- introduced herself, she gave me her name, and she said, oh, and by the way, I'm a staunch conservative Republican and a devout Christian. Unfortunately, those two labels are very triggering to me based on my own past and my own past experiences, so I braced myself for the worst. So she asked her question, which was really simply, why do you do what you do? Why do you dress that way? So I answered as best I could, and she asked follow-up questions, and I answered those and tried to satisfy her curiosity as best I could. And as the conversation went on, it became less about why do I look this way 
and became more about who are you? What's your life like? Do you have family? What do you do for a living? What's your pursuit? Oh, are you a Republican like me? No, okay, agree to disagree. We went on and became more about the person inside than the person as we appear. And even toward the end of that conversation, she confided in me enough to share that she had suffered from child abuse and that she had actually used adult bondage as a therapeutic coping mechanism. Now, had we not had this conversation, these were things we would never know about each other. And then as I was packing up and putting my laptop away and zipping it up, she said, oh, could you stay for just a few more minutes, please? I really want my friends to meet you. And she was very gracious. So a conservative and a cross-dresser walk into a coffee shop and a friendship came out. Had we both held to our preconceptions either on appearance or on our initial labels of self-description, neither of us would have looked past the glamour to see the humanity we both have inside. If I continue to be marginalized by people's perception and conditioned responses, they will always see me as a threat or even offensive. And conversely, if I go out into the world, I may always have my guard up and be wary that people will threaten me for how I look. The trick is to go beyond that conditioned response, beyond that 13 milliseconds, beyond that blink of an eye, and temper that reaction with empathetic intelligence, curiosity. Know that how you appear to the world is not the whole of who you are. So in that way, regardless of race, creed, color, religious affiliations, marital status, your religious beliefs, it's all based on making that 13 milliseconds drag out into something more substantial, more fulfilling, and be curious, be engaged. Recognize that the person in front of you is not the whole of how they look. There's so much more beyond that. In conclusion, I wanted to thank the TEDx Emory team for inviting me to the red dot today. Just proof positive that we can always exceed expectation, that we always can go beyond our self-perceptions and our perceptions of others. Remember, first impressions may set the world stage, but staying throughout the performance will undoubtedly give you a much richer human perspective. Thank you.